Hey guys, how are you doing? I am doing much better. Thank you for not asking. We are in, I believe, the 11th, 11, running out of fingers, 11, 11th episode of the never-ending saga of the Galliano junk pile. If you're seeing this now, there's some good news and some bad news. The bad news is you have to watch the playlist for this guitar, and I'm giving you a link right up there right about now. The good news is I'm sitting here with my low volts t-shirt on. Um, low volts is a trash blues artist out of San Diego. You're going to love him. I've wasted enough time between that last point up and this one. I want you to watch that one up there. I'm going to give you a link below. Low volts and the artist information. I've decided to name this episode Details. Let's talk about Tim Lohman first. His songs, one of them I would give you, is called Granny's Gold Teeth. Now, the first time I heard this song, I thought, this song has a great beat. It's got slide. And that's all I need, a kick, drum, and slide. But the song talks about somebody's grandmother willing them, like in a will, their gold teeth right out of their head. So imagine somebody thinks of you in their last will and testament and gives you their gold teeth as your inheritance. True story. So I started looking into Tim's songs and I ran across Up From the Depths. Try to find this one. You know what? I think I'll give you a link below if you can find this one. It's about Tim's grandfather, great-grandfather, a traveling gospel preacher, singer, etc., who was framed for murder and almost died in an electric chair, which caused me to build a couple of guitars based on that theme. And you'll see the story of one, the Switch of Death coffee can, guitar in which he sings a cover that you will know that caused someone to give me a copyright strike on that episode and what they said was we are going to take half your money okay so we got half my money versus half of Depeche Mode's copyright money who's the loser there right okay so again Tim's songs are full of details. This is a good read. You're going to like Tim's music. If you like the guitars I build, he's got a couple of them, and you're going to like it. So back to this mess we call the Galliano Jump Pile. If you recall, we did the one thing that you never want to do with an archtop guitar that's junky after buy it. Yeah, and that is take the back off of an arch top guitar. You do not want to do that because the minute you do, everything is flimsy. Um, I gave you, I'm going to burn up all my cards right away. Uh, a buyer's guide to Econo arch tops, like what to look out for. Yeah, when you start getting the back and sides cut loose, this all becomes very, where is it? Fragile, where are you? Anyway, I'll just say fragile this time. I'll, I'll owe you one. Anyway, you end up getting twists and stuff, and any time that the back and sides are looser on the neck, it's a problem. In fact, there is a guitar in the L.A. area right now that someone is trying to sell. It's got a big crack running right here, and I, and I can guarantee you, that that crack happened because something was cutting loose on the head block. Anyway, we're getting way out in the weeds. But the last episode, episode 10, we put the back on this, and it was called Sealing Up the Back. So if you want to jump right to that one, fifth card out the window right away, link up there, hover over those I symbols up there, and you will find episode 10, which is putting the back back on this guitar. 
So we did it in thirds. This is all cracked. You can see it. The other episodes tell you everything. And we glued this up, and the last part was getting this neck angled just right so it sat on the bridge and we clamped everything. And we're going to start off this episode by pulling the clamps up and because the neck was shifted when we pitched the angle, there's going to be some body to trim away here. Um, we had done a lot of work on the fretboard. The final fret work has not been done. We have to put fret markers here. We're going to put matchbooks on this. We got a set of Grover Imperials that we prepped the guitar for. Um, we, what else? Oh, I've got some metal pieces and scrap apparatus um, that will be themed to this car. So we're going to junk pile this thing up. If you've watched, you know that we've already got the electronics in here except for the input jack. Um, there's a lot of little things to do, but this thing is oh so close, like metric system close to being ready to be pitched around a couple musicians that I know. So you can be completely and utterly disamazed. Now, there is a rite of passage on these junky guitars. This one was one of the worst ones that I ever have worked on. I thought the East LA cutaway was bad. Oh no. But I bought two guitars from the Sean Mann Dude collection. Um, I don't think they were worth what I would have spent on gasoline to drive to the post office to pick them up three miles from here. But anyway, that said, there was so much to do on this guitar. And there was a couple points with the neck, the body, and even the fretboard where I thought, you know what, this thing's about ready to go in the fireplace. But there is a rite of passage. When you see Tammy sign the back of the neck, there's light at the end of the F hole. So, we're going to get Tammy to sign this. Once we get these clamps off, so we don't want to scratch up the table, but we're going to get Tammy to sign this. And then... We are going to go to work doing a lot of little tasks that will show you how to tail in, tail in, complete. For those of you that didn't learn oil field language, we're going to tail in this guitar with the final details. Let's get a paint pen out and then let's get to the bench. All right, good deal. Oh, by the way, we found Fragili hanging out up here where it's not supposed to be. Anyway, we're in a good spot here. You'll remember that we had to worry about this neck and the fingerboard and the neck angle and the bridge all lining up. And that had a lot to do with the clamping that we had to do. Now, I like this part because we can put away the hide glue heater. We can put away the tape dispenser and we can put all these clamps in a bucket that we can take over and put them away. I'm actually going to put them away along with this kind of stuff that I've got a drawer for doing exactly this kind of work. You'll find out that if you get little work areas or old cigar boxes or things that you can put your tools in and label them on a shelf within reach you can get to doing repetitive tasks over and over and get a bunch of them done like oh there's one I'll show you right now when you build one neck and cut scarf joints build several there we go so you'll remember we put hide glue on this we made sure that it was glued up in spots where it would come together because it had all kinds of problems. Now, we put tape on the side. I've told you this before. I'm going to tell you again. If you're working on expensive guitars like Martins and Gibsons and you start putting tape and 
stuff like this on the body of the guitar, you're going to end up ruining a finish. This one was actually ruined, and I actually improved the look of it by doing this kind of garbage to it. So, here's the first thing we're going to look at. Let me see if I can get this angle right. You can see right here, there's some of the body sticking out here. See that? Just a little bit. And that is because we took the angle of the neck and pitched it. Let me see. If, yeah, like this. We pitched it. And so because we pitched the neck while it was loose from the bottom, this would flex back and forth. If the neck goes down, this pitches in. If the neck comes up, it pulls out. And what I was trying to tell you before in the opening is there's a guitar in the L.A. area that shows a big crack right here. The rest of the guitar looks good. But for that crack to be here, that means something's twisting here. So chances are somebody look at had never been through junk piles like this one would look at the neck and think, okay, well, the fingerboard or the neck is warped or, or something like that. It's not that complicated, but it involves taking the back off and doing work in this area in this area in this area to fix that kind of stuff up so we are going to strip all this stuff off and start putting pieces together and I think the first thing we should worry about is this overhang on the body where it all fought me to come back together here in the front. We're going to work that down. But well, we're going to have Tammy sign this thing first. Let's get that done. Oops, I almost forgot. Why did I have this blue tape on here if you didn't see the last episode? There was so much hide glue going on here that I didn't want any bleed off to run down the side of the guitar. You can see there's some bleed off there. And when I pull this off, most of it goes away saved a lot of cleanup time oh 13th to the last thing you see these orange pieces of binding tape you see that mark right there you see that one there here here and all over the place those were marks to tell us how to make everything line up and despite a little bit of stick out here and there it all came together pretty well Okay, guys, the first thing that we are going to work on is are these little bits of body that are sticking out there and especially on the top end near the neck right there. We want to make sure that first off that we tape off anywhere where the body is going to be flat next to where we're going to have to take it down. Now there are a couple of ways that you can do this. The quickest way by far, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but these also work great for cigar box guitar neck pockets where you cut the notch, notch in and then you get down in there and they simply rotate uh, this way. Make sure you understand the grit of the belt, that the tension is right, and which way the belt is turning. Because if it's going the wrong way, it will try to pull the back of the guitar off. You're trying to pull the work into it. Of course, you're going to do some dust control. But this is really good for taking off some of the heavier stuff. Um, you can adjust this by loosening up this knob and turning this just about any way you want. There's a belt tensioner here and um, an adjustment for that the belt is centering here, but you can basically just take this like so and work and get it very close like that. Handy thing. You'll wish you would have had one the whole time. It comes in great for everything. Now, Next thing we, we want to think about is 
razor blades are great tools but you see I put scotch tape on the edges here because I want to limit the working area here so if I'm going to come in and get off some glue right here that tape keeps me off of this part of the body I can also use it for scraping like so you see how that takes that glue off of there really easily but again use scotch tape to give yourself that margin of error um, one layer of scotch tape will put you right where you need to be um, the old trusty file from Stumac great item has no teeth on the sides or the end you can do this with any file just go to your belt sander and lay it on there flat you can also use your belt sander to keep this true so again tape it off you can just come in like this it takes a lot of material off quickly I've got this little thing called a hand plane finger plane it works really well you can adjust the blade in it. it's easy to sharpen once I get close I can just take this like so once you start touching that tape right there that should be a warning sign to you I also have a number of scrapers of different configurations these are great you just go along and they'll remove a lot of material fairly quickly and then of course there's nothing like a sanding block at the end to get everything in shape so I'm going to go around and make sure that everything is trued up here the, the the glue is removed and let's get that out of the way Okay, guys, we're going to work on the frets next. I have a number of fretting tools ranging from the coarsest down to all kinds of stones that I can um, make everything very smooth. I can polish them or whatever. But considering what this guitar is, considering it would have had wear patterns and things like that, I'm not really careful with this too much. These frets are taller than the original skinny ones, if you remember right. But I'll tell you what, flat out, whether it's a cigar box guitar or whatever, the first thing is I get the edges of the frets as close as I can, get good fret 
pliers, please. Don't play around with something because you're going to waste your time anyway. Get them close. Make sure they're leveled pretty well before you go to work on it. But the first thing that's going to happen is you get these old guitars, and whether they're new frets or old, they swell and shrink, and there is nothing worse than going down the edge of the fretboard and having your fingers catch. So there is nothing like a good bastard file just to go along like so and make sure you do the same number of strokes and get the ends of those frets in order like so. Um, they make fret dressers that look like this. They have a, a belt on them, different grits. There's a slight groove in here and you can take these and catch the ends and knock those down. Again, count the number of times you do something so they're all the same. They make protection devices that go on a rubber band. You put those right there. If you're really picky about that, put a rubber band here. Have several of these. And then this thing is a diamond embedded thing that somebody's going to try to use to do their nails with. But these things are awesome. You can file frets. You can take a fret rocker. Look at this thing. This is a fret rocker. Notice that there's different sides and lengths. You can find out frets that are high. See how close together these get. You can use this one to go between a couple frets or this one. You want to make sure they all look pretty good. But look at this. This is a fret rocker, except it has a patch of this diamond debris or whatever you want to call it and I can put this between frets here this part rides the frets if I find a high fret I can just take this and if anything is high on this fret because the smooth parts ride the frets and this is just a little bit lower it will dress everything up fret kisser very very expensive as is this but this one if you're doing your final intonation and setting your bridge and stuff and you've got something that's not just right, you can actually go under the strings. You can do the ends and turn it here. These things are very handy. They make different angles of this. Um, again, trick is get everything right. Then I'm going to clean this off, make sure there's nothing on here. I am going to put matchbooks on this, believe it or not, and they match the theme of things. And because there's matchbooks on here, I'm going to have to put fret markers in the appropriate places on top of the neck. Of course, I'll touch this up a little bit with some oak gall ink, and but I think it looks good trashed. Who knows? You don't like it? Don't buy it. Okay, fretboard is done. Everything's pretty smooth. Nothing's sticking up. It eyeballs well. When we get strings on it, that'll tell us. But since we're going to put these matchbooks on the fretboard, we're not going to be able to see any frets. So we're going to have to find a way to mark the frets. First thing you want to know is that left or right-handed guitar, you want the fret markers up towards the player. So we're going to put fret markers on the 3rd, 5th, 7th, and 12th fret. And so what you do is on the respective frets, if you're going to have one on the 5th, you go between the 4th and 5th fret midway. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then you're going to take an awl, which is different than an owl, and you're going to pop a tap a little hole right there, get a starter point. Then you're going to take the right drill bit, which matches your fret marker material, and you are going to have put a piece of flapper tape on it like that and put it drilling straight down. And you'll know when you're there because the flapper tape will push the sawdust away. Then you take your appropriate material, black or white, I think white's good this time, and you put a tad bit of household white glue. This is the only time I use this stuff. And then I'm gonna take the material, push it down in, 
Fill the bottom out. Put it up just a little bit, like so. And then we're going to take our violin maker's knife and just cut that off like that. Tap it down a little and then take our razor blade with the protective scotch tape and do that. See them? When we get to the 12th fret, we're going to do two markers there. Since we are going to put matchbooks on this neck, there seems to be some cleanup that needs to be done because I need the adhesive to stick. Do you see what's under there? Don't tell anybody. Anyway, what we are going to do, the best stuff for this is some kind of stuff that they don't want to sell you in California, but the old Zippo fluid. You put a little bit here and there, like so, and then wipe this stuff off. And it will take care of anything that would mess up your matchbook job. And it all vaporizes off. But if you're going to do these matchbook things, I've given you episodes uh, to how to matchbook a neck. If I've got a card, I will give you one right up there, right about, look at that, I'm getting so good at this, but not fast enough to stop this from vaporizing. Anyway, they will stick now. Look at that. Okay, we're getting down towards the end of the fingerboard, so it's a matter of marking here, here, and then seeing where the edges line up. And simply cutting like so. I should pass the proficiency test for second grade based on what you've seen anyway. Look at that. I would tell you what it says if I could read Italian. All right, guys, next step. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff to the body now. And if there's something we want to do before everything gets in the way, like the uh, pick guard and the surround for the pickup and all of that kind of thing, we want to get it done now. So this is going to shock you, but we are going to go to work to make this body look good. And you're saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, you right there. You're saying... This is the worst body I've ever seen. Well, hey, guess what? You've not seen me with the lights on, and no, that was not an invitation. So let's just suffice to say, hey, Karen, this is my channel. Listen to me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get a piece of sponge. Go ahead and get a real sponge, not some something or other that is made out of something you don't even know that's got a cancer warning on it. You know, in California, even the receipt that you buy something has a cancer warning on it. But anyway, you're going to get a piece of sponge. You're going to get some Meguiar's Scratch X. Get this. Don't get anything else. This is actually a rubbing compound. It takes away scratches. It also works to take away glue and blemishes and who knows what we've done to this thing. And you're going to need a microcloth like this. So what you're going to do is you're going to take an amount of this. doesn't take too much. And you're going to go around the whole guitar and you're going to put this stuff on in circular motions 
and you're going to pay special attention where you feel the sponge digging in. That's glue, that's foreign objects, not like wrestling foreign objects, just regular foreign objects. And you're going to go around and you're going to rub this stuff in again in a circular motion. You're going to let it dry to a glaze. Now, once that's done, yeah, this is going to make everything shiny, even the bad spots. So you're going to take your cloth, your microfiber cloth, you're going to take two fingers here, wad it up like this, and you're going to go along and you're going to work this stuff off. Now, if you find a spot where something is hanging up, you go back to your sponge and you rework that area. Again, there's glue and stuff. And you leave it sit there till you're done with the rest of the guitar. And then back to your fiber, your microfiber. Do you hear that? You're going to be surprised here because, you know what? Ain't that something? You can see it, huh? I hear your lips smacking out there. Yeah, this is one of the most glamorous things I've seen too. And believe you me, I find the best when it comes to glamorous. You're welcome. I'm going to get back to work now. This is completely and utterly disamazing, but the next thing, yeah, you're not even going to believe it yourself. Yeah, it's taking that glue off right there. Ooh, ah. Uh, that shined out nice um, again if there's little spots you go back in and work those by themselves you want to watch using the stuff when it's too hot especially on a car because it will dry up and then it's kind of a nightmare to get off but wherever the glue was the stuff is good at taking off those little bits of glue but now we're going to tackle the next thing which is the fingerboard all right, body came out great. Front, back, sides, bottom, everything came out great. Did you expect anything else? Now, next part of the project of the details is pit guard. You have to have a pit guard. This is the stock pit guard. Flimsy, gasses off, does whatever. We're going to have to do a little bit of modification because we put a pickup on here. So this is sticking out. So you have to line some things up. There's a hole there. There's a hole there. Why am I using my finger? Chick flick teal pointer. It's Father's Day. Do your job. What's that? Oh, I am your father, chick flick teal pointer. Hole there, hole there. But when you look at this and you look at this up here, all this Ital it uh, Italian, Italian stuff, this does not go here. So I had to think of something to theme this properly. So you're probably asking yourself, where did I come up with this idea for the pit guard on the Galliano junk pile? Well, I went to Genizzi's Pizza in Palmdale, California, cultural capital of the world, and there it was right in front of my face. The Leaning Tower of Pizza. Completely and utterly disamazing. That's right. That's where this idea came from. You'll, you will live it with me here now. Let me share. Thank you for sharing. Anyway. Ooh, ah, uh, look at that. <laughs> this is what I was waiting for the whole time in the mail. Anyway, we put this on here. It's missing something. It's half the, half the building. Is this a building? I don't know. I've never been there. Um, there are some people I know. I really think they should have a mother-in-law's convention, like right up there. Right there, definitely. Anyway, this does not fit. We want this to be wider. So what are we going to do? Well, Gabernick is bugging me for one of these, so I, I'm going to have to do something different. So let me show you. 
something ingenious. Now, let me find it. I know I had it here. There it is. This is rocket science, so I will be using the rocket science pencil. So, here's the idea. This is about the same size as this. Again, Gavernick is freaking me out. So, what do I do to make this bigger? Well, this is a Patron 700, 7,000 box that will hold a license plate, but I don't use them for that. I just destroy them and use them for, well, the other part of it is right under there. Remember, you can see it, but it's upside down. Trust me, you'll have to. Anyway, so if I take a washer and I want to calculate how much wall space, I don't know, the distance between here and here I need, I can put that on here, hold it at a slight angle, put the rocket science pencil, and just go around the, see that? Flip it over like this. If I didn't have you guys to babysit, this would be much easier, but let's pretend I enjoy that. Anyway, see that? It walks right around like so. And immediately, this is big enough. Once I get it cut on the bandsaw to sit on there, trace this out. And I'm trying to figure out if I should correct the lean on my guitar that no one could correct. And I don't know, this has been up for like at least 50 years, right? Anyway, let me get this done. I'll show it to you. All right, guys. I am really, really happy with the way this is all turned out. We've got tuners to put on top now. And... Um, We've got to get a long bit running in from here uh, to bolt or screw this uh, pickup to the side of the neck. Um, we've got some detail work to do, like um, uh, the knobs and stuff, but the tailpiece all come together nice. I had everything pre-drilled. This thing is getting really, really close to sound. Okay, guys, we're putting a little paste wax on this peg head or headstock, whatever you want to call it. We're going to make sure some of it drifts down in there because if there's nothing here and these tuners lock up after a while, it'll chip the paint out the next time someone wants to change these out 80 years from now. But a little paste wax on a piece of sponge. I have a story to tell you now. It's a sickening story, and... Had I not had it happen to me, I wouldn't bulimic myself. But I wanted a set of Grover Imperials. You know, I don't like gold packages, but hey, it looks great on here. You see that? Stair step tuners. This is pricey stuff. So I find a used set. It says Grover right there. I put them on. You saw this in an episode. And then I discovered something. This one is stripped out. It doesn't work. Great. So I'm thinking, do I, have to, do I have to find a different one? Can I fix this one? Because like a Baptist preacher, it doesn't have to work. So thanks, Sunhouse. Anyway, so I figure I got to go looking for one of these. If you want to be on the open market at the whim of the market, just let everybody know. I'm looking for one of these. I just have to have one. So I looked all over the place. Did I ever tell you? I'm pointing at you now. Let me get some help from Chick Flick. He'll point her to point at you. Did I ever tell you about the time that I filed election papers for a rebid for the school board seat I've held for a while? And I bought a guitar after I picked up my papers and filed my papers. And I bought the guitar. The guy brings out another guitar. It's from Ukraine. Yeah, on election paper filing day, I'm associated with Ukraine. What a scandal. Well, guess what? You know where I found the replacement tuner? Yeah. 
What does that say? Can you read? Does that say Ukraine? Does this look like something you'd find in America? Yeah, I found the replacement tuner in, of all places, Ukraine, comrades, Ukraine. Anyway, let me get this put up together now. All right, guys, I've decided that this is a great place to stop this episode, and we'll segue into the next one in which we pull up the old footage of what this used to look like and what the Galliano junk pile looks like now. It plugs in, it plays, it makes noise, but as much as that junky vehicle is going by right now, and a little bit more, there you go. Feedback sounds about the same, but where I'm at on this thing is I've got some work to do on the nuts and frets and final details. And of course, once you string these things up, they take a little bit to settle in. So um, if you don't know how to take a junky guitar based on all the information I've given you in these playlists, where you could take this Kamiko Kamiko guitar that you see right here. Do not covet this because it never fails. About the time I get one of these done, another one shows up. But hey, give me a like and subscribe if you haven't. Again, I'm putting this all in a playlist. And I swear you could go out and buy just about any arch top in any kind of condition. And there has been something in this playlist that will tell you how to fix it. So in the next episode, we're going to hear it and we're going to find some musicians to show us what it will do because it's taken a long journey to get here. And I thank you for being here for that journey. And I will see you next time.